Welcome to Facebook Expo Hot Talk. My name is Whitney. I'm a hardware engineer in Facebook. I'm in charge of AI, machine learning, hardware system design. And here, my partner Sam. Yeah, we two together are going to talk about Facebook AI infrastructure. I'd like to start with question how Facebook is using machine learning. So AI or machine learning is really a key tool Facebook is using to help people manage the tremendous amount of data. Every single time you log into Facebook page, we are really using AI to uh, show something really important to you, show something really matters to you, something you really want to see, and we show them to you. And of course, we want to run also show you the most relevant ads. We use AI to do face recognition, also translation. As long as there's any barrier that communicate, prevent people communicate to each other, that's the barrier we're working on and we're using AI to help on that. So how does the AI or machine learning execution flow look like? This is a general machine learning training or inference execution flow. It starts from data, it's a pipeline. It starts from the data, so we collect the data from our images, the user likes, comments, and the, how the, the way how the user interacts with our platform. We collect this all kind of data, and then we abstract the feature from the data. For, to run machine learning algorithm, we want to um, extract something like meaningful to machine learning algorithm. And then after we get the features, we perform training. Out of the training, we will get a model. We put the model into our evaluation system. And then we check the performance. So the performance measurement will be different with different kind of services. For example, if we're doing um, object uh, detection, then the performance will be accuracy. If we're doing something like a translation, uh, we care about the quality, then the performance may be a score. So we check the performance. If the performance is good, then we ship it to inference to do the prediction. If the performance is not that good, then we redo the training again. So normally, training is offline, and inference is online. These are our Facebook major AI services and algorithms. Uh, one thing I want to share here is that it doesn't always go with deep learning. We do have some very good non-deep learning services such as uh, support vector machine. So SVM is really something we're using to do face detection. It works pretty well. And there are also gradient boosted decision trees, GBDT, we use it for our Sigma service. So Sigma is a anomaly detection framework that we're using to do, um, for example, um, site integration, the span detection, inappropriate content detection, and so on. The rest of the services are all involving heavily using deep learning. Uh, we're using, so for example, our ads, our feet are using um, multi-layer percep perceptron. These kind of workload also involve large sparse data we put into our um, large embedding tables we call sparse neural networks. I'm cover a little bit more about sparse neural network. And um, of course, we are using heavily using um, convolutional neural network. We use it for image, image classification. We use it for um, video understanding. And then for the recurrent neural network, which is uh, um, time relevant, which is perfect for language translation or speech recognition, such kind of workloads. We're facing a lot of challenges when we do machine learning or AI at scale. Basically, you see from here, um, both training and inference, we're facing network challenges, we're facing compute challenges, we're facing um, memory, bandwidth, memory capacity challenges. Um, different workload will drive to different hardware system design resource. For example, 
um, CNN normally is a compute intensive, and for our sparse uh, um, we have a large embedding tables to fit into the system. So we request a lot of memory capacity to hold the model. And uh, in order to assess this kind of table um, faster, we need a higher memory bandwidth, basically. So what do we do with them? Um, how do we deal with these challenges? The way, I would say, um, AI basically changed the way how we design our hardware system. The way we do today is really hardware, software work together to do the system co-design. So this morning's session, you probably see Facebook is announcing that we are enabling both uh, training and inference accelerators into Facebook infrastructure. What does it mean? So you see accelerators normally is probably from compute rate side, it can be as high as 100 times um, compute rate um, comparing with a traditional CPU. So it really could shift the system bottleneck from compute bound to other system resource like network, like memory. There are different ways to deal with them. When your model is small, you can fit into one system, then we, we can easily do disaggregated design uh, to simplify the hardware side. And then we can do data parallelism to improve the time to training, for example. But when your model is big, and then you, sh you split the model into different systems, it triggers a amount of network challenges. So they're all, all, we can always consider to aggregate multiple accelerators into one system to improve the performance. I'm not going to cover uh, how we're going to do the system design. Um, Sam later going to show you our next generation AI system from both, for both training and inference. Oops. Um, next, I, I'm going to cover Facebook AI development ecosystem. What are the layers underneath this um, main part of workload, like data, training, and inference? Basically, we have uh, different layers. We have a platform, we have a framework, we have uh, our backend uh, compiler libraries, and we have our hardware on the bottom layer. So Facebook Learner platform is really an important layer that um, runs machine learning or AI end to end. If you, see, if you still remember, we just covered um, the machine learning or AI workflow. We have a feature. We have a feature, we have a training, evaluation, prediction. So FB Learner is an end-to-end -end platform, covers all of them. It allows, uh, it allows um, users who don't have um, um, expertise on machine learning area, they can also start the training work or the inference work. Uh, they can pick the features from the FB Learner feature store, they can uh, do the training, and then they can evaluate the, the, the evaluate the performance and then they can do um, prediction sort of things. So FB Learner is really a one to end to end platform for us. And framework. Framework uh, holds uh, framework basically provides a scientific compute package. Uh, it does the model execution. So up on second half of last year we Facebook, we have a two different kind of framework, PyTorch and Cafe2. So one for research, one for production. And then we have uh, developed Onyx. If you still remember, um, Open Neural Network Exchange as the bridge to convert um, PyTorch to Cafe2. So PyTorch was developed by our AI research team. Um, it really research oriented to do faster prototype. It's pretty flexible and easy to debug. However, um, when we do like at scale deployment, the performance we see sometimes a challenge. So for deployment, we use a Cafe2. Cafe2 was built for scalability and stability. Um, but the convert, uh, even we have an Onyx, uh, the convert from PyTorch model to Cafe2 model to do deployment, it consumes time and it also really complicated. So last year, we decided to combine these two together. We call PyTorch 1.0. So PyTorch 1.0 will cover both 
research as well as the high performance deployment. Um, regarding to what we do at the back end side and also the uh, how do we do the hardware, I'm going to hand over to Sam. Thank you. All right, let's give a round of applause for Whitney, everyone. Thank you. So I don't know why it does that. Don't worry about it. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm one of the AI TPMs here at Facebook. I'm going to talk a little bit about picking up where we left off. So let's talk about frameworks. As you can see, there's a lot of different frameworks to support here. So just imagine if, ignore that, just imagine if all these different frameworks were to produce different outputs, right? That is not scalable. So the whole idea here is that all these frameworks would have one output, which would be Onyx. Onyx stands for Open Neural Network Exchange. It's our sort of output for all the frameworks that feed into the compiler. So for some of you who come from a compiler background, you have GCC for mainly C, C programming. We have Glow Compiler, which allows us to compile neural networks for all sorts of targets. So this includes various vendors that we announced earlier, accelerators, compute. And the idea here is that you have one main source that actually outputs to all these different accelerators with their own library supports at the bottom. So talking about the back end, the compiler, optimizer, library, um, obviously, as you know, there are various vendor optimizers. There's Apple Core ML, which is really for iOS. There's NVIDIA Tensor RT used for NVIDIA. We have Intel Nirvana, Qualcomm SNMP, and they have their own respective libraries, right? So they have like QNN MPAC for mobile CPU, Intel MKL, which really gives you that optimization to speed up in terms of performance. And so we have FBGM, which is also open source. We have ML Compiler, which is a Facebook Glow that allows us to have one to many. It allows us to support very various hardware, as I mentioned previously earlier, to, to support all sorts of vendors, all sorts of accelerators. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Glow in the next few slides. So the compilers and optimizing libraries here, on the input, you could technically have Onyx. Uh, you have PyTorch, you have C++ uh, inputs, and we provide API for you to be able to interface with Glow, even through C++. So the core of the compiler is really the Glow core. This is really the graph. Uh, it, it, re it's, it really defines the graph component. You have the optimizer and the quantizer. So quantization, for example, you're quantizing from FP16 down to an int 8. So you have to profile that to make sure it's being done. That's what the profile data there is. And finally, you have code gen. Now, code gen is really doing the scheduler aspect and the memory allocation aspect so that you could implement this for all these different targets that you see out there. So x86 CPU, OpenCL, and various ASIC uh, uh, accelerators that we'll cover in a bit. So today at Facebook, we support various types of hardware. There's a Bryce Canyon uh, that's really used for the high density storage. Those uh, data components that Whitney was talking about, they're all stored on this type of hardware. And finally, we're using Big Basin uh, combined with the Tiago Pass head node to do the training aspect for all this data. So that's, that's that training that you see up there. And finally, we're moving over to type one. We're moving over to Twin Lakes. So Twin Lakes is basically the main uh, server type that'll start you know, introducing all the inference type hardware uh, that you saw earlier with regards to our production workloads. So really, we've introduced standard M2 form factor. Wait for it. Uh, this is an ASIC. It has its own little DRAM. Um, it's roughly in the 12 watt range. So this is the module power is under 12 watts. Uh, and it supports PCIe by four. This is a single M2, so that's by four. I'll talk about uh, the dual M2 here. So dual M2 similarly has its own ASIC, its own DRAM. Higher power envelope, obviously, roughly about 20 watts of TDP. And because it's a larger package and has a larger area, we support by eight in this case. So the King's Canyon, we call this, by the way, the King's Canyon accelerators. Um, they're really uh, various accelerators uh, provided by various vendors that come in these two form factors. They really go inside a carrier cart, which is our Glacier Point carrier cart, um, and all of that goes inside your Yosemite V2 chassis. So as you all recall, we can take two of these Twin Lake processing nodes out, and we can put two Glacier Point carts in to, self, uh, to help serve as your carrier cart for the accelerator front. So how does this all work? In terms of the block diagram here, uh, imagine the Twin Lakes that we were just talking about as a CPU side of this. You have a PCIe switch that can serve you know, for anywhere up to 12 uh, different accelerators. So the accelerators that we have, they have their own memory, as I mentioned earlier. So these are the, they're blue here. It looks purple down here. The blue boxes down here. Um, and 
you're, you, you also have a total aggregate memory. So in the case of Twin Lakes, you could have, let's say, 64 gigs of memory on your uh, Twin Lakes side, and each of these can have anywhere between, let's say, 16 to 32 gigs of memory. So on, on total, you have a lot of memory aggregate to use, and this really helps out, because if you have really large models and lots of embedding tables that you're trying to parse, especially in that case of the sparse NN, you can fit it on in here. And finally, they're all connected via PCIe Gen 3 to the networking, in which case the Yosemite V2 platform gives you 50 gigs, and, and we, we are planning on potentially upgrading that. So let's talk about training. So training, this is uh, our large memory unified training platform, Zion. Uh, as you can see, this is a sort of eight-way system. There's eight of everything in there. So we have eight sockets with eight accelerators, eight OCP accelerator modules, the OAM that Whitney uh, talked about earlier. Um, this is a really kick-ass platform because it allows us to speed up the training. Um, it allows us to have a coherent setup so that we can have, wait, there we go. So we can have various CPUs, so that's eight CPUs to do your processing component for your compute heavy applications like say CNN and as well as a dense component of your sparse NN. And finally you have eight accelerators and they uh, handle your uh, acceleration component and they all have their own fabric. So this makes it really awesome because the fabric allows them all to talk to each other as well as the CPUs. So there's one fabric for the CPU, one fabric for the GPUs. Now, the, the, the idea behind this setup is that you have high bandwidth memory available on your accelerators. So in the cases where you need a lot of memory throughput in and out, that can come in handy. At the same time, you can have memory in the order of terabytes on your CPU component that helps you on the footprint side. So you get best of both worlds with the versatility of each of them. So putting it all together, this allows us to go back to the features that we talked about. It allows us to train, it allows us to inference, and it allows us to speed up in all of these aspects. And this helps us support for FB Learner, FB Learner feature, feature Store, the data APIs that support that, and finally all of it sits on a back-end compiler optimizer library that we previously talked about. There is various hardware at the bottom that support this entire end-to-end. -end. And finally, this, this helps us with, in, ter in terms of our FB Learner Flow, which is our service for the training, as well as Predictor, which is what we use for inference. So what really changes when you try to scale over to serving 2 billion plus people? Think about that for a second. This is a lot of compute that we have to do to serve all these people. Well, it really goes to addressing all the scaling challenges that we talked about. There's lots of data, there's lots of compute. Scaling this globally is a huge challenge and wide variety of models with their own set of complexities. And finally, full stack level of challenges. And so really to address this, I'd like to echo to a hardware software co-design being a crucial aspect of all this. This really means that whatever hardware that you're designing with whatever software that is gonna sit on top of it, it's very important that they're all coherently designed together. And so application, hardware, and software all need to work together for all this to work. So I want to remind everyone that this journey is really 1% finished, as we always say. Please join us for AI-related workshops tomorrow at 2 o'clock, OCP OAM module with Whitney, as well as 3.30, OCP OAM module in specific. Thank you.